All right, good morning and welcome everyone to our Men's Club Breakfast program uh, featuring the uh, subject is Feeding the Earth with Space Technology presented by our own Ed Rosenthal. Um, the, as usual, the program will be from 30 to 45 minutes, probably about 45, followed by a question and answer session of approximately 15 minutes, depending on how it goes. Uh, during the program, if you wish, you can enter questions in the chat, and I will alternate between uh, written questions and live uh, questions when you answer. I'll ask you to raise your hand. Uh, other than that, uh, your microphones should be muted. If you see that your microphone is not muted, please mute yourself now and remain muted during the program and during the question and answer unless you're called upon. With that, uh, I would like to turn the program over to Rabbi Ed Weinsberg, who will introduce it. As has already been mentioned, we welcome all of you to our Men's Club uh, Breakfast. This is the third monthly breakfast out of five for the 2020-2021 uh, uh, season. Uh, the topic, as you heard earlier, is feeding the earth with space technology for tikkun olam. Our speaker, Ed Rosenthal, with his wife, Betty, has been a member of our synagogue, uh, Temple Beth Shalom of Sarasota, for many years, since 1982. It's that same year that they founded an advanced uh, fertilizer company called Floricam, which their sons, Eric and Jonathan, joined in the subsequent years. The uh, company has a legacy of numerous uh, business successes and awards for ethics and product quality. Among its accolades, uh, Florican was inducted three years ago into the Space Foundation's Space Technology Hall of Fame. When uh, Ed invented his plant product in his home garage back in the early 80s, little did he know that uh, one day it would be a significant feature for travel in space. Nor did he know that one day he would join forces with another Jewish person, NASA astronaut Jessica Myers, on the International Space Ship which is currently circulating our planet Earth. Ed has a lot to say about this and related concerns, which he'll convey in his own words and in a video and PowerPoint presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. So as we go along, I encourage you to enter your questions or comments in the chat room uh, or box of this Zoom broadcast. And now, without further ado, here's Ed Rosenthal. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, thank you for organizing this. Uh, it has been my privilege to uh, have been um, a NASA collaborator uh, for many years. We started our uh, association with, with NASA in 2005 and we've been working um, uh, ever since. So um, today's program um, is going to uh, consist of an overview of the NASA Veggie Program, or what's known as Space Plant Biology. There's a, um, an overview of about 23 minutes, which will include four embedded videos by um, some of our NASA colleagues. Um, there's an embedded video by Dr. Joya Massa of the Veggie Program. Um, please pay close attention to that. Uh, we, we all work uh, for uh, and with Dr. Massa, who thought of the Veggie Program. It was her basic idea. So what we're going to do is present the emerging science of space plant biology, which is the NASA success of growing veggies um, in the advanced plant habitat on the International Space Station. Now, during the presentation, you'll hear us refer to spin-off, um, NASA spin-offs. Florican, our controlled release fertilizer, is a NASA spin-off. The technology we use to coat the fertilizer to apply the, um, the release mechanism was developed by NASA. They were using it um, on the shuttle. It, it's an advanced polymer that deflects heat and cold. And NASA taught us uh, through the Space uh, Alliance Technology Outreach Program how to use that technology to coat fertilizer. And it created uh, a company of some hundred people and um, really helped to, um, to improve agriculture. So what is a NASA spinoff? A NASA spinoff is the technology that is developed to work in space, that is used in space, 
must, according to NASA's uh, charges, improve life on Earth. It works in space. How does it improve life on Earth? So some of the um, really famous examples, there are so many, but some of the famous examples are GPS. GPS is Global Positioning Satellite. It's in everybody's car, but it's a NASA spinoff. It was, it was developed to be used in space to determine where satellites are in orbit. And of course, that's had a tremendous impact on navigational system. Recently, um, NASA developed something known as collision avoidance radar, which is again to prevent these satellites in a very crowded uh, low Earth orbit from colliding into one another. And this collision avoidance radar has protected us. We don't see very many satellites falling out of space uh, from collisions. And this is now being used in many vehicles. And if you're driving the vehicles, you'll try to change a lane and suddenly be pushed back into your lane. That's a NASA spinoff called Collision Avoidance Radar. So some of the interesting things we'll be talking about today is NASA spinoffs from space map biology. How some of the technology we had to develop to grow veggies in space, how is it improving um, agriculture? How is it improving life on Earth? Um, so in terms of NASA veggie, when we started the program, and I've been in agriculture, um, you know, since I, was a, since I was a kid, we had to forget about everything that we use on Earth to grow food, everything. As you're gonna hear in the presentation, um, water floats in space. There's no gravity. Um, there's no light. We can't use soil because soil has got that bacteria content which would kill the astronauts. So no soil, no light, water is floating around. And um, we had to, to use our controlled release fertilizer for nutrients. So that is the challenge. Since we had to develop that technology to grow vegetables in space, how can those technologies be used on earth to improve um, food production and agriculture here on our planet? So um, in starting the presentation, we're gonna have the overview um, of the uh, uh, Space Plant Biology Program. Um, and there's four embedded videos. And let's start that and then I will speak to some of the technology afterwards. Welcome to the 2020 Space Plant Biology PowerPoint. Today we're going to present the emerging science of space plant biology, which is NASA's success of growing veggies in the advanced plant habitat on the International Space Station. Florican Controlled Release Fertilizer is a NASA spin-off, and Floricans proud to be collaborating with NASA's Space Plant Biology Program by providing Floricam encapsulated fertilizer, which is one of the technologies making it possible to grow veggies in space. And as we go through the PowerPoint, please note the many collaborations based on technology transfer between NASA, a federal administration, and Floricam, a family business. Floricam controlled release fertilizer is the only fertilizer recognized by the Space Foundation as a certified space technology. And in 2017, Floricam controlled release fertilizer was inducted into the Space Technology Hall of Fame with NASA Kennedy Space Center. That is an only an America story. Where else but in America could a family business become a NASA collaborator and be inducted into the Space Technology Hall of Fame? And here in the next slide is the video of our induction into the Space Technology Hall of Fame. In the early 1980s, Ed Rosenthal noticed one of his fertilizer customers struggle to get plant food mixed with water. He had an inspiration. With a work background in polymer manufacturing, over time he experimented and developed a new polymer coated controlled release fertilizer. No mixing needed. And in 2003, his company Florican introduced its first stage nutrient release product. It earned Florican a US patent for a new method of easy, accurate fertilizer application. His innovation also won the prestigious National Society of Professional Engineers National New Products Award. 
Recognition included the opportunity to have 40 hours of collaboration with experts at NASA's Kennedy Space Center's Space Alliance Technology Outreach Program. SATOP scientists suggested that Flora can try a new three-stage polymer application that NASA was working on. This new technique of producing stage-release fertilizer, patented in 2006, proved to be very successful. Growers could use less fertilizer, increase crop yields, and significantly decrease environmental damage. Encapsulated fertilizer is widely used in yards, farms, parks, and golf courses. Back in space, NASA asked Florican in 2013 to assist in vegetable growing demonstrations aboard the ISS. Using a specialized growth medium, the veggie program is producing crops of fresh lettuce, cabbage, and tomatoes, welcome additions to the astronaut's diet. Today, Florican produces its staged release fertilizers in Florida, and patent owner J.R. Simplot manufactures and distributes Galaxy One staged nutrient release products around the world. It's another down-to-earth way space technology helps to feed a growing population. And that's only in America. That's the American dream. God bless America. The veggie program on the International Space Station grows vegetables with Florican controlled release fertilizer, developing a fresh food sustainable system for astronauts in space. Florican was selected through a long-standing relationship with NASA to provide technical support for an encapsulated controlled release nutrient product for the veggie program and the advanced plant habitat. Florican and NASA are collaborating to grow veggies in space. And here's a video prepared by NASA about our collaboration. A long relationship with NASA has improved one company's approach to developing controlled release fertilizer and led to new formulations for specific types of plants. The controlled release technology, improved with NASA's help, allows for the use of far less fertilizer far less often, reducing cost, labor, and environmentally harmful runoff. As an example of collaboration between a family business and a government administration, Florican is so proud to be collaborating with NASA to develop a fresh food sustainable system for astronauts in space. And there's our veggie team. Notice the diversity of the group of scientists who participate in growing the vegetables in space. We're so proud to be part of the NASA veggie team. And here in this slide is a picture of the veggie grow box from the International Space Station. Notice the pinkish light. We'll talk about the light that had to be created to grow vegetables in space in a later slide. And there's astronaut Stevie Swanson, who was working on the veggie program on the ISS for us. And our historic day was August 10, 2015, when a crop of outrageous red romaine lettuce was grown in space with Florican controlled release fertilizer, harvested and eaten by our astronauts. It was a very proud day after many years of research. In the next video, Dr. Joya Massa, Project Scientist, Exploration Research and Technology Programs Office at Kennedy Space Center, presents our veggie program. Here's Dr. Joya Massa. We've been testing a variety of different crops to grow in veggie. Uh, we began with leafy greens, specifically this red romaine lettuce, which was selected because of its small size, um, its high growth rate, its excellent germination, and um, also the lettuce has very low natural microbial levels associated with it so it would be safe for the crew to eat. The astronauts harvested the lettuce that's been growing for 33 days and the harvest had two parts. First they harvested some leaves from each plant for consumption um, and they had a little bit of a, a celebration and then they harvested the rest of the plants for our science. So those plants were harvested into um, foil and frozen in the minus 80 freezer on ISS and they'll be returned to us to do analysis of that tissue. In terms of how safe the food is, we assessed that by first growing a set of lettuce in space and having it returned to Earth last year where we tested a number of different um, aspects of that crop. We looked at the food safety of that crop and we didn't find anything that led us to believe that it wouldn't be safe to eat. To grow enough food, you know, to support the crew, 
takes up a lot of, of volume in a spacecraft where, where volume is very expensive and it's limited. Um, you know, we're trying to grow highly productive plants and plants that are a very small stature. And so we select crops that have a very high edible um, proportion of their yield. Uh, this is called the, the harvest index, the proportion of the, the edible biomass to the total biomass. For the first crew to Mars, they're probably not going to have a lot of food processing or food preparation equipment. And they may not even have cooking equipment. And that's how it is on the space station right now. They don't actually have an ability to cook any food up there. So all of the food that they're growing is what we call pick and eat. It has to be able to be eaten fresh. So we've been looking at lettuce, other leafy green vegetables, dwarf tomatoes, dwarf peppers, radish, um, potentially some herbs that can be picked and mixed in with a package diet. And we're even starting to look at small fruit crops. We've been testing some dwarf plum trees. But again, these are all things that can be eaten fresh. Once we are established on Mars and we have a long-term base, we may have more equipment to be able to process and cook food. And so then things like sweet potatoes or white potatoes or beans could easily be grown and used to provide food for the diet. So we're testing both types of scenarios, but for now we're concentrating on what could be cooked or what could be picked and eaten without cooking. So we've had a lot of feedback from different crew members who were on the space station during the first veggie test and also during the second test where they were allowed to eat the, the produce. Um, in the first test, I think the crew actually really wanted to eat the lettuce, but they were good. They sent it all back to us. But the, the consensus was that we need to be growing more vegetables in space station that they really want to grow things that they can eat more than ornamental crops um, and that this is something that, that the different astronauts really couldn't imagine going for longer or farther into space without, without having this little slice of earth there to remind them of home. They all really enjoyed the first harvest of lettuce. All the astronauts and cosmonauts were around watching and taking photographs. And we had numerous comments and photos throughout the growth cycle um, about how much they enjoyed watching the plants grow and helping to mark the passage of time. In this grow out, again, we had a lot of really positive feedback from the crew. Um, basically, they were all there for the harvest except the Russian cosmonauts who were out on an extravehicular activity. And the astronauts saved some of the lettuce for the cosmonauts to eat for when they finished their EVA, which was really wonderful. Um, when they ate the first batch of lettuce, their comments were, were very supportive and enthusiastic, and they seemed to really enjoy it. So that just made me feel wonderful that I was able to help be part of a team that could provide them with, with such a source of enjoyment. One thing we really hope is that the crew will be able to um, pick which types of plants that they want to grow in the future. So we're working to develop a, a crew garden mentality where they can select which crops that they'll want to grow and then eat them. So we have, you know, a lot of steps to get through to get there, but I don't see any roadblocks in the way. Thank you, Dr. Massa. So many interesting points to discuss, but Dr. Dr. Massa mentioned how many days it took to grow the lettuce in space. Do you recall? It was 33 days, and that's an incredible accelerated time frame. It takes normally 60 to 75 days on Earth, so it's quite an achievement to have grown the lettuce in that accelerated time. To date, eight crops of leafy green veggies were successfully grown on the International Space Station by the veggie team with our Florican controlled release fertilizer. The eight crops are outrageous red romaine lettuce, dragoon lettuce, Waldman's lettuce, Chinese cabbage called Tokyo Bicana, wasabi mustard green, bok choy extra dwarf, Mizuna mustard green, and red Russian kale. Now, it wasn't easy uh, to grow these veg vegetables in space. There were challenges. For example, we have microgravity instead of gravity as we know it on Earth. There's no light. There's no water that we can really utilize readily. No soils allowed to be sent 
to the space station. The nutrients change their solubility and some float and some sink. So these challenges to grow veggies in space had to be overcome for us to grow these crops in space. What we needed to achieve is a species selection that would help us succeed. Species selection for veggies reliable and quick germination. As Dr. Massa said, 33 days from seed. A high edible biomass, meaning a lot of food on the top of the plant for the astronauts to eat. Low microbial potential, the plants can't get sick in space. And high antioxidants, the plants have to give the astronauts what they need to be healthy. Now as an example of the challenges, of one of the challenges in space, here's what happens to water in space, as Commander Chris Hatfield demonstrates on the internet National Space Station. What happens? I'll get up close so you can see here. Oh, there's one, there's one ball of water floating around. I'll put it on the washcloth. Okay, so here's a soaking wet washcloth. Get the microphone so you can hear me while I'm talking. And now let's let's start wringing it out. It's really wet. It's becoming a tube of water. It's becoming a tube of water. It looks very cool. The water's running up my hands a little bit. Hey, Tom, can you come grab me a towel, please? I got one on the wall. It's over here by Sevis. So it'd be on the other side of Sevis there, stuck on the wall. So The water is all over my hands, in fact, it rings out of the cloth into my hands. And if I let go of the cloth carefully, the water sort of has it stick to my hand. The surface tension of the water keeps it stuck to my hand. Thanks, Tom. You grab the microphone. Okay, so the experiment worked beautifully. And the answer to the question is, the water squeezes out of the cloth, and then because of the surface tension of the water, it, um, it actually runs along the surface of the cloth and then up into my hand, almost like you had jello on your hands or gel on your hand, and it'll just stay there. Wonderful moisturizer on my hands. And the cloth doesn't really unravel itself. It just stays there floating like a, uh, like a dog's chew toy, soaking wet. Great experiment, worked perfectly. Meredith and Kendra, congratulations, great idea. So again, what's different growing veggies in space from growing veggies on Earth? Microgravity instead of gravity. Light had to be created. There's no light. Water floats, as you saw in that video. No soil. We had to choose an inert media. The nutrients change, and the roots, because of the microgravity, grow in all directions. And here is how we did it. The veggie system, as well as including fluorocan controlled release fertilizer, had to have light created. Blue and red wavelengths are the minimum needed to get good plant growth and they turn out to be the most efficient in terms of electrical power conversion. Notice the pinkish light. That's what we created on this for the space station. The media. The media selected was silica clay, and the silica clay has a high CEC, standing for cation exchange capacity, which is the total capacity of a growing medium to provide essential nutrient uptake. Since water floats, NASA designed veggie plant pillows, and in the veggie plant pillows, water was introduced as a sub-irrigation 
navigation. So the water stayed under the media and was pulled up by the root system. And Florican controlled release fertilizer was used to opti optimize plant nutrition. The next major advanced plant habitat, APH, on the space station. The APH is fully computerized with 180 sensors measuring everything from CO2, oxygen, water, etc. The ISS has the APH with the farmer. That's a farmer with a pH. Plant habitat avionics, real-time management express rack. And as I said, fully computerized growing system. The APH, or the Advanced Plant Habitat, is part of the Bioregenerative Life Support System, or the BLISS. This large plant research facility will help us to create the Bioregenerative Life Support System using biology to support the crew in long-range space flights. The BLISS may include plants, microbes, water, air processing, and waste recycling, making everything completely efficient. Water recycling on the International Space Station is recycled through a distillation and filtration system, which removes urine and waste byproducts. On the International Space Station, 85% of the water in urine is recovered for potable water for the crew on the International Space Station. An incredible advancement, which can be used on Earth for sewage recovery. NASA has invented an ammonia recovery system for wastewater, which is a closed-loop system for recovering ammonia from wastewater. The technology is state-of-the-art ammonia re removal. Removing ammonia nitrogen from wastewater and using a media that is selective for ammonia, recycle the ammonia nitrogen for later use as a fertilizer, and regenerate the capture media for reuse in the system. Although the NASA system is developed for a smaller scale space-based application, this ammonia recovery technology is scalable for larger industrial and municipal wastewater needs. Floricant engineers specialize coatings to encapsulate the nutrients which optimize plant nutrition and reduce environmental impact. The Floricant controlled release fertilizer received the Gulf Guardian Award from a program administered by the United States Environmental Protection Agency the only fertilizer to ever be so honored, and Florican received the Gulf Guardian Award twice. Florican controlled release fertilizer is a NASA spin-off, and the technology that we use to encapsulate the fertilizer was assisted by Space Alliance Technology Outreach Program in 2005 to help us perfect the technology. As a result, Florican controlled release fertilizer is featured in NASA spin-off magazines, both in 2017 and 2018. And we're so proud of this collaboration with NASA Kennedy Space Center. This was part of NASA's game-changing technology transfer program, where targeted fertilizer techniques resulted in growing veggies on the space station and can improve growing veggies on Earth. As NASA's quote about Florican states, as NASA furthers its investigation into the complicated science of space agriculture, Florican can use the same technologies to create positive solutions on Earth, and we are doing that. And recently, we made history in space agriculture on the International Space Station. American astronauts are using innovative controlled release fertilizer technology blended by Florican, an American family business, to grow Mizuna mustard greens on the ISS. Jessica Mayer, a female American astronaut on the International Space Station, is featured here as she used innovative controlled release fertilizer technology, which we blended as an American family business, which we sent to the ISS to grow Mizuna mustard greens. Jessica Mayer not only grew the uh, Mizuna mustard greens, but she harvested them and then did a taste test for us. And here she is featured on the ISS uh, tasting the Mizuna mustard green. We're so proud to have had her assistance and thank you, Jessica Mayer. And with Floricant controlled release fertilizer, vertical farming on Earth is a reality. Veggies on Earth is the future of agriculture. Notice the amount of the vegetable plants growing up in vertical farming. Controlled release fertilizer is mixed into the media, as we do on the space station, and water is dripped from the top down. Six baskets of strawberries, instead of one strawberry plant in the ground, we have six baskets growing up. We have 12 baskets of vegetables growing up in the picture from uh, second on the left. And then some beautiful uh, vegetables also grown in the baskets. And vertical farming is something which can provide more food for more people 
on Earth. That's the future of agriculture, innovation, and this assistance in perfecting this technology. Here we can have the possibility of urban farming, growing our vegetables in an inner city where we don't have to ship it thousands of miles, and the vegetables can be grown without pesticides and healthy food for more of our people. Thank you for your attention. As we said, the veggie program and the advanced plant habitat together with NASA spinoff create the ability for us to grow more food for more people. We were also so honored to be inducted into the Space Technology Hall of Fame. And we thank you for your attention and thank NASA for giving us this opportunity to participate and collaborate in the veggie program. Thank you. Okay, so to date, um, we have successfully grown eight crops of leafy green vegetables on the International Space Station. Now, um, the selection of these veggie species is done um, with very rigorous research. <clears throat> they don't choose just any lettuce or any cabbage. Um, the first part of the, the selection of the species um, has to have reliable and quick germination. Um, again, we're growing these on the ISS, but they're in preparation for um, a future Mars mission. The moon mission is 2024. The Mars mission for colonization is scheduled for 2030. But with our colleague Elon Musk, he's pushing us to get Mars colonization by 2024, 2025. So the key part of that has to be uh, sustainable food production as they leave their orbit. So the reliable and quick germination, um, typically we're getting 33 days from seed to a full uh, head of lettuce um, on earth under normal uh, agricultural principles at 60 to 75. So we're reducing um, the crop time by at least half. Um, high edible biomass, it doesn't really um, matter if you have a lot of roots growing, you don't want a lot of roots, you want what the astronauts are gonna eat. So high edible biomass is principle number two. So we have to have a big head of lettuce. You can see just to the right in the, in the video an actual picture of the first crop of lettuce we grew. That's called outrageous red romaine lettuce. That's the actual side, size of one head of lettuce. Now, low, low microbial potential. We're not gonna use pesticides, herbicides, no dangerous chemicals permitted um, in, uh, in the space station. So the plants have to be healthy. They have to be able to fend for themselves. And the fourth principle is high antioxidants meaning that um, we have to have a good quantity of protein or high antioxidants in these vegetables if that's all the astronauts are gonna able to eat. So those are the four principles that go into selecting which veggie species are gonna be grown in space. Um, if, if we could suggest to people who have a home garden or a patio where they can grow vegetables in spots, in pots, take a look at these crops, these eight crops of of vegetables, grow them yourself. They are extremely healthy and very, very tasty. Outrageous red romaine lettuce was our first crop. Then dragoon lettuce, Waldman's lettuce, Chinese cabbage, which is also called Tokyo Bicana, uh, wasabi mustard green, bok choy, Mizuna mustard green, and Rus red Russian kale. Those are the four crops. Okay, um, can I have the next slide, please? So, Remembering the challenges, what's different trying to grow vegetables in space and growing on earth? Well, no gravity or microgravity, no light to speak of, we have to create the light. As I said before, the water is floating, um, no soil permitted, so we have to find a media um, that is inert, that's not gonna handle or carry any bacteria. The nutrients change solubility and the roots because of the lack of gravity go in all different directions. So with those six challenges, we had to find a production method that would um, basically grow vegetables without those principles we have on earth. And here's some of what we did, the light. Um, after years of research, Dr. Matt Mickens, we call him Dr. Light, he, um, he determined that the combination of blue and red wavelengths combined 
are the minimum to get good plant growth. They not only get good plant growth, but they accelerate the growth. And they're very efficient in terms of electrical power conversion. You can see the combination of the red and blue light um, and you get this pinkish hue. Um, that's the actual color of the veggie box used on the space station. Now this principle of creation of light has been adapted by a lot of hydroponic um, growers, um, indoor um, where it's legal, um, cannabis production has started to use this kind of light in uh, California cannabis production. And it's very, very efficient and it, you know, it, it, it extremely accelerates the production time. So that's the light. Um, now no soil is allowed. So here's a picture of the media. The media which has been selected is called silica clay. Now silica clay has what's known as a high CEC or cation exchange capacity. That means the high um, capacity for the media to move the nutrients from the media into the plant. And silica clay is the highest that, that was found on earth. Now in commercial agriculture, silica clay was never used to grow vegetables. And I would ask the question all the time of, um, of, the, of the NASA colleagues, why are we using silica clay? And they would say, you know, Ed, uh, please don't ask those questions. We're, we do what we're told to do. And that's what we're gonna use to, <clears throat> to grow in space. Well, just as, a, as an aside, recently, um, we have a rover called Curiosity on, on Mars. And Curiosity has a long arm, which digs into the Martian soil and then sends us back the analysis. And it's, I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but Mar Mars has got silica clay all over the environment. So which means since silica clay is the, is the media that we were able to, to use successfully to grow vegetables, once the colonists get to Mars, they're not gonna have to bring a truckload of soil from earth, which is not realistic. They'll be able to grow uh, straight into the silica clay media that's on the Martian surface. So I, I found that to be a real coincidence. Now, since water was floating, how do we get water to the root systems? Well, the NASA veggie team designed veggie plant pillows and these pillows are configured so the roots are trained to go downwards. So it, it's done by retraining the root systems to move down. And then there's a picture of the controlled release fertilizer which is encapsulated, which is used in the media. So those are the four principles that were used to overcome the six major challenges of growing vegetables in space. As far as the impact on earth, the blue and red light has become uh, a standard in hydroponic and indoor uh, farming, the controlled release fertilizer we manufacture. And of course, sub-irrigation is, um, is a known principle in agriculture. And next slide, please. <clears throat> so from the veggie box, NASA is always giving us challenges and the astronauts don't have time to water the plants and they don't have time to take care of their food production. They're busy steering uh, a spaceship at tremendous speed. So the NASA engineers um, invented the advanced plant habitat and the advanced plant habitat or the APH has the farmer. Farmer notice they have a pH in the farmer. NASA is always choosing, choosing these interesting names. Um, pH for farmer, and pH stands for plant habitats, avionics, real-time management express rack. And there you see a picture of, uh, of the inside of the actual uh, farmer system. Of course, they had to call it farmer because we have farmers on earth. This just happens to be a different advanced farmer in space. Okay, so next slide, please. So the advanced plant habitat has 180 sensors and 180 sensors is a fully computerized growing system. They turn it on, they flip a switch at Kennedy Space Station. It measures everything from carbon dioxide to oxygen to water and basically grows the food itself. Now, part of the APH, which I like to discuss when I make my presentations in the school, is it contains a bioregenerative life support system. 
also called a bliss. I might have called it something else, but they call it a bliss. A bliss in the farmer. Trying to be a little humorous here. But the bioregenerative life support system has a bio, a microbial bioreactor. It takes the urine, it takes the feces and the in, inedible waste from the plant material and changes it to oxygen and potable water. So it's using biology to support the crew in long range space flights. It's got tremendous potential to improve agriculture and other systems on earth. Because remember, it's taking urine and feces, putting it through a microbial bioreactor. And then out the other side comes oxygen, food, and water. The okay, next slide. So as I said, the water on the International Space Station is recycled through a distillation filtration system. And it removes urine and other waste byproducts. So I'm sure as all of you know, on the International Space Station, 85% of the water from the astronauts urine is recovered for potable water from the crew. That's right, they're drinking what they excrete. So also in our veggie space plant biology program, we use the potable water from the International Space Station system. So that said, that's an incredible achievement. Now it's a small scale system, but does it have an opportunity to be used to help us recycle water from our sewage system? Next slide, please. Well, yes, it does. Um, all of human excrement is basically urea nitrogen, urea nitrogen. Now, as urea breaks down on earth, becomes ammoniacal nitrogen or ammonia nitrogen first. And then it will become NO3 or nitrate nitrogen, which is the form of nitrogen that the, um, the plants can absorb. So what NASA has created on the space station is an ammonia recovery system for wastewater. It's a closed loop system and the urea breaks down, becomes ammonia, and um, the ammonia is completely recovered from the wastewater so that the water that um, is, is, is distilled is completely potable and free of any disease. So it's a regeneration of the system. This is available for licensing and the ammonia recovery system could be used in all of our sewage treatment plants. It's not yet, but it easily could be used and adapted and we would be able to stop our sewage dumping into our lakes and rivers and the bay. Because the sewage dumping is the principal cause of red tide. The harmful algal blooms are directly caused by the sewage dumping. And we have all the research that's been published that tell, tells us if we want to end red tide, we have to stop the dumping of urea, nitrogen, or sewage pollution into the water. The only, only thing that makes sense. Well, that technology is available on the space station. And just like GPS or global positioning satellite changed the way we navigate in our vehicles, and just like collision avoidance system is in our cars, stopping our vehicles from having accidents when we're driving inappropriately, this system, the ammonia recovery system for wastewater could be the game changer. And I'm waiting for a county and a city or the state of Florida to adapt it. Okay, next slide. So we made history again in 2019. Uh, we grew a crop of Mizuna mustard greens on the space station in 33 days, space agriculture. Uh, we designed the, the blended fertilizer that was used on the space station. But we were so, or I was so excited that the, um, the astronaut who helped us grow the Mizuna mustard green was Jessica Meir. And Jessica is a, a female Jewish American astronaut on the International Space Station. She was assigned to help us uh, using our controlled release fertilizer uh, to grow Mizuna mustard greens. So it was interesting because we had, you know, a Jewish family business with, um, with, you know, Jewish scientists and technology that had been developed to grow the 
the mustard greens. And here was a Jewish American astronaut uh, growing the mustard greens for us. Here's some pictures of Jessica uh, growing the Mizuna mustard green in the grow box. Uh, that's the middle picture of her. She was on the uh, cover of Fertilizer Focus magazine. She tasted in Mizuna mustard greens for us. And um, just a very uh, interesting and exciting moment. And then recently, um, the Artemis program, which is uh, our, our moon landing program scheduled for 2024, um, we're very proud to, to inform everyone that uh, Jessica Meir was selected um, to be the first female uh, American astronaut to land on the moon in 2024. Jessica selected uh, to be uh, in the Artemis program. And being that she's a Jewish American female astronaut, it's going to be quite the day for us when she steps foot on the moon in 2024. So congratulations, um, uh, Jessica. Any questions at all from our viewers for Ed? Sue, did you have a question or is your hand up? <laughs> I think there are some in the chat box, Ed. Okay. Let's see. You want to monitor that, uh, Elliot? Can you pick it up? Uh, the first one, I, the last one I see actually is uh, he wants, the Bay, oh, it's Iris, wants to know what Ed's academic background is. Oh. Okay. Well, I studied polymer chemistry um, in university. I have a few, a few degrees. I don't think you want to be bored by all, all of the list of them, but um, I have a Bachelor of Arts degree. I've, I've written uh, several published uh, texts on um, the Hebraic and biblical elements in Herman Melville's Moby Dick, um, which I would like you to read. It's very interesting. And from there, because... Um, uh, I had quite the scholarship in university. I also have a, a science degree with, um, with, with a degree in polymer chemistry, which um, in 1971 was just the emerging science of how to use plastics. That's it. Uh, Ed, before I, we go on, can you just sit back a little so we can see your whole face? That's great. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Elliot? I see another one that asks, uh, what were the last four crops? Oh, uh, the, yeah, the last crop that we just grew was Mizuna mustard green in 2019. Um, Apparently you listed several and they were only able to write down the first four. Oh, I'll read them again. Um, the first crop was outrageous red romaine lettuce. Actually delicious um, red romaine lettuce. Uh, the second was um, Chinese cabbage, Tokyo Bacana, yeah, very tasty. And then um, red Russian kale, bok choy, the extra dwarf one, wasabi mustard green, Waldman's lettuce, and dragoon's lettuce. Those are the eight. Thank you. You can, you can get the seed um, for that from Johnny's Plant Farm online and then get some of the Floracan fertilizer from Home Depot, or um, I think Amazon has it too. Um, the, the, the technology I like the best is 14414, uh, type 100 day and type 180 day. Mix them together and they'll give you six months of uh, good growth for all of these eight vegetables. Mm -hmm. Now we use, we use on the space station 1868, um, but the 14414, is being used to grow the red robin tomatoes and other flowering crops, and I, I prefer that. They they are both very, very good products, but I prefer the fourteen four fourteen. Uh, I have another question from Randy Wynn. How do you determine downward when there's no gravity? The question is, how do you determine? Well, we try to create microgravity. Um, which is a lot of what the astronauts have to do in order to, um, to go into space. They have to work in, a, um, in low Earth orbit or in the uh, anti-gravity chamber. If that's what you're talking about, it's really a question of control that the human beings 
bring to their body. There, there's no way of completely creating gravity to replace what we have on Earth. Thank you. Uh, I'll just mention Randy Wynn put another link if you all want to look in the chat box to a space Torah project, another good story of Jews in space. If you had an unlimited budget, mm -hmm. which of your projects or initiatives would you like to see funded, Ed? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Can you hear me? Definitely yeah, the, uh, the, I mean, we've got the ability to grow the food uh, as a science and uh, we can replicate that in space and on earth. And so we're very grateful that that's happening, but it's definitely the sewage treatment, uh, the water treatment where we can actually, um, you know, take um, sewage water that's been treated and run it through this um, ammonia recycling and end the contamination of our water systems. That's, if I had the unlimited budget and Washington was a safe place to go, I would go and pitch that to the Congress. But um, we, need to, we need to get the state of Florida to step up. Um, we have such issues here like they had in Chesapeake Bay. We need to treat that sewage water. We can't keep dumping it. So unlimited budget, ammonia treatment in every sewage plant. Yeah. Along those lines, uh, I wondered, we have Josh Mellitz with us. Can you unmute yourself and answer a question whether there's room for Israeli uh, interaction with the products that, uh, that Ed Rosenthal has invented? Hi there. Thanks so much, uh, Rabbi. And that was actually my question about the, so that was a perfect answer because yes, of course, um, you know, water solutions are uh, you know, Israel's at the forefront uh, uh, in the world at that as well. And I am, and, and, and I have actually spoken about this too. So, uh, and for those of me, I'm the uh, representative for Jewish National Fund here in Sarasota. So uh, that's why I was called upon as well. So thank you again for a brilliant conversation and, and presentation. And uh, it's wonderful to have uh, someone like you in our community to, to highlight these issues and to be working on such important work. Thank you. Yes, we um, we use Israeli technology on uh, obviously reverse osmosis. You know, we have uh, salt water on Mars, so it's uh, it's going to be the Israeli system that it's going to be going um, with the colonists to Mars, so they can um, move the salt out of the water uh, and have po uh, potable water. Um, so we have uh, that. Also, the drip irrigation was used uh, in our method of introducing sub irrigation. We're very grateful to Israeli agriculture for giving us those two technologies. But the ammonia recovery system, it's something that hasn't been adapted anywhere yet on earth. And that's something we can work on in Israel. Everyone has these same problems with too many people and too much sewage contaminating our water system. This ammonia recovery system, again, you're talking about astronauts who cannot get sick, who drink their own urine, and we're not gonna poison them. So 85% of all the, uh, the urine on, on space station ends up being potable water. That's a huge number. Um, and we need to reach out to our political um, people in counties and cities and have ammonia recovery licensed from Kennedy Space Station and put into every single sewage plant and the contamination of our water. Just like GPS changed our navigation system, and it did. And 30 years ago, would you have dreamed that spending millions, if not maybe billions of dollars to develop a global positioning satellite system would have such an impact on navigation on earth, but it's changed it. I mean, when's the last time you roll down your window and says, where's St. Louis street? And it just doesn't happen. That's the type of impact we can see with our water treatment. And I'm most interested as I stay involved with the NASA technology and I'm designing the, the next uh, a red robin tomatoes that's going to be grown on the space station this coming year. Um, I really would like to see, not like to see, I would demand to see the sewage treatment system improved by the American NASA technology of ammonia uh, recapture. So um, I'm going to come back to the written questions in a minute, but I see Patricia Bork has your hand up. Please unmute yourself. Um, yes, I sent a written. I, I sent a written question to you. Will you talk about what you see as the kinds of issues that make it that would stop 
the United States or have stopped us from pursuing these kinds of sewage treatment um, alternatives? Are they political issues? Are they financial issues? I mean, clearly they're financial issues, but in so many ways, it makes so much sense. So would you talk about what, what issues you see, what issues you anticipate uh, um, regarding this, please? Well, NASA is a, uh, an administration that, as I said in opening the talk, that believes in developing technology used in space to improve life on Earth. And they've done it repeatedly so many times. I mean, I'd invite all, everyone to download nasa.gov to your phones or your iPads. Um, once you have downloaded nasa.gov, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, there's a little blue box that says all news. And uh, NASA just doesn't believe in advertising for itself. But if you click on all news, it'll bring you to all this technology that I've been discussing and so much more. Um, quite honestly, the future of our planet is there in the technology that NASA has developed and is developing. Regarding the sewage treatment, regarding the... Uh, ammonia treatment. I have done everything I can as a collaborator. NASA has a technology transfer system. It's not a financial limitation because the system to put this ammonia recovery does not have that, that much cost to add it to the sewage treatment plant. You're not, you're not building a whole new sewage treatment plant. You're just adding ammonia recovery. It's political who's going to be the first to take the step of saying, we have a problem with our water, we have to do something about it. Who's going to admit it? Sarasota? Manatee? Who? Um, Dade County? Broward County? It's prevalent in the entire state and not just Florida. You know, Chesapeake Bay is a problem. I would think most of our water treatment plants in the United States struggle um, with too much sewage because we have such overpopulation. It's political. Um, the technology exists at Kennedy Space Center. It's, it's strictly a matter of one of our uh, county commissioners or uh, our governor just reaching out or having someone reach out to Kennedy Space Center and talk to the licensing department of technology transfer. It's that simple. You know, that's what happened with GPS. Um, some bright people who wanted to build a navigation system in vehicles reached out and said, we can use your GPS system on earth. Um, how do we license it? And that's how it works. And it's the same with our fertilizer program. I mean, basically we have the technology that came um, from, from NASA. They've been using to deflect heat and cold in space. And it's just changed agriculture where we fertilize crops like sugarcane once a year instead of 12 times a year. So the ans answer to the sewage treatment is write your political folks, tell them about it in case they don't know, I guarantee they do, and tell them to get off their chairs. Um, that's a polite way of saying get off their you know what, and get this license to our communities. It'll make all the difference. And a question uh, about food in addition to, uh, so your presentation concerns growing plants, but uh, what protein source is provided to the space crew? Okay, so I guess that uh, went over everybody said we oh, build it gone into, over my head. <laughs> we build it into the into the species selection. In other words, there's not going to be protein. Um, once once our colonists leave um, low Earth orbit, um, let's spin it forward to Elon Musk 2025 or NASA's timetable is 2030. Once they leave and the colonists are on their way to Mars, they've got a seven month journey and a seven month journey, they're not gonna be getting a, a protein in meat or chicken or fish byproducts. It's gonna come from the vegetables. So the vegetable or species selection have to have high antioxidants. Read into that, that it's going to be protein delivered in vegetables. That's the species selection. So that's where the protein is gonna come from. All right, and uh, Evie Mitchell, uh, who was a former school bio, high school biology teacher, wants to know if you uh, present this to high school groups. 
Oh yes, I've been very honored out to travel. Before COVID, we we tra we we traveled all across the country and we present our our PowerPoint to high school, middle school, and university uh, biology, science students, chemistry students. Um, we did a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. I'm a certified space technology educator, so I'm one of um, seven individuals who have the privilege of going into any school in the country that invites us and we present this type of, um, the PowerPoint you saw today is an abbreviated one. The one we present in the schools has a lot more detailed science and it's about a, a 60 to 75 minute PowerPoint that we present in auditoriums to, to schools. The answer is yes. High right, schools so no. Yeah. That's not exactly my question, Ed. My question was, do you talk to them about how you got involved in doing this? Not oh, what you're doing now, but how you, the steps you took to get involved in it. Yes. Yes, that's part of the program. We talk about the Space Alliance Technology Out, Outreach Program, which is how we our first got involved with NASA. Uh, it helped us to develop the technology to use on fertilizer. And then how we were um, requested to help them produce the uh, space plant biology to use on the ISS. We talk about that in detail. All right, there's a, there's a question, since it's a uh, weed-free sterile environment, why do you need to worry about pesticides and herbicides? Well, we don't, that's the point. We don't worry about it, we don't okay. use it. That may have been a misunderstanding then. And um, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me see, uh, how do you control the microbes in BLSS from overproducing and taking over? Well, we only have, uh, fortunately enough, uh, beneficial microbes and since we're using a, uh, an inert media. Uh, the microbes have a tough, up, a tough time finding a place to reproduce if they're um, not beneficial microbes. So, uh, you know, in dealing with inert media and an inert environment, uh, such as we've created on the space station, um, we don't have those issues. Now, so if we were shipping soil or if we weren't, you know, uh, taking the water and running it through the filtration system, yeah, there would be harmful microbes coming out the other side. But when we run it through the microbial bioreactor, we're removing all of that in the water. And we're again, and the media is completely inert. We're not using soil. So again, the, the thinking that that question came from is, okay, we have those problems on earth. We don't have them in space. Okay, very good. I think we have time for one or two more. Uh, Ed, uh, Iris would like to know what your academic background is. That oh, no, I, 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 no, excuse me. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, Joel, I already asked that, but oh, I asked okay, another good. question, which is, what would it cost Sarasota County right now to adopt the sewage system? I mean, if one of us was to get the ear of a county commissioner and they would say, okay, tell me what I need my budget to do it right now. Well, it's a licensing system. I, I, I know NASA is interested in having this technology utilized. Um, so it would be just a question of um, uh, implementation and building in the ammonia recovery system. Uh, I don't like to give uh, a firm amount, but it, it would not be an astronomical amount because the licensing, which would be the real cost, would be probably waived or NASA would probably do something again to help um, the United States, to help its country. So um, I, rather than take a guess, I would suggest uh, a phone call, <laughs> an email to NASA Technology Transfer. Trent Smith is the head of the department. He'd respond immediately, but they would only have to do it on one of their sewage treatment plants first and then do some water tests at the back end to see the opportunity of getting 85% uh, of that water to be potable. Um, so if it got discharged into our lakes and rivers, it would no longer contain all of the harmful urea nitrogen, all of the sewage. So I don't think it's a matter of cost as, as a matter of it's who's gonna be first politically to move forward and admit their problem and take the step forward. Very good, thank you, Ed. I believe we could take one more question. Can I see a raised hand? Anyone? Oh. Uh, there, are, there are, okay, Rabbi. 
Yeah, I do want to wrap up our program, but first, I, I imagine, Ed, that one of your sources of inspiration was the space program's creation of what eventually became Tang, right? The powdered orange juice? No. No? no. Was that something that is among their achievements, or is that just a rumor? Well, it's one of them, but it, it, I don't think it cuts a candle to GPS, do you? Not at all. Not at all. I'll drink to that, though. Uh, the, uh, I do want to thank you so much uh, on behalf of all of us today for your not just your wonderful presentation, but your incredible work behind the scenes uh, of making this a uh, Earth a more user friendly place. Thanks for your actual on Earth projects as well as in space.